series, Britain's Best Bakes. So in this series, I'm gonna take some iconic bakery recipes from Britain or inspired by Britain, give them a little bit of a Peter Sidwell twist and deliver them straight to you every Saturday morning, 9 a.m. on Facebook for the next eight weeks. Right, for today's episode, I'm gonna take the humble sandwich, so a cheese and ham sandwich, and give it some credibility. I'm gonna give it the Peter Sidwell touches, and then we're gonna show you how to make the most delicious ginger nuts, or ginger snaps, or a very ginger biscuit. But first of all, it's time for Bread 101. So if you have never made bread dough, today is the day. And I'm gonna show you how to make a basic recipe that will see you through bread making until you get the sourdough bug. This is a basic white bread dough. You can use this for pizzas, you can use it for bread rolls, bagels, loaves, you name it, you can use it for basic bread making. So, 500 grams of strong bread flour, okay? So it'll either be called strong flour or bread flour in the supermarket, okay? That's what you need for bread. It's got a higher protein content, which means you can knead it and develop the gluten and it makes better bread. All purpose, normal flour does not work for bread. Then I have got seven grams of dried yeast. Um, and if you're gonna use fresh yeast, double it. So I've got seven grams here to make a loaf. This is basically a loaf, all right? And then I've got 10 grams of salt. Let's bung it all in a bowl. I've got a nice shallow bowl as well, so you can see what's going on. I thought that would be a good way to do it. So blend it together. Make sure all the salt and the yeast are blended. You don't want them in direct contact of each other because salt will kill the yeast and then your bread doesn't rise. All right, that's it. I remember teaching you to make bread once, Emily. Yep. How was your bread making skills these days? Yep. <laughs> yep. Are you watching? Carefully yeah, and listening. I watch it very carefully. Emily gets ringside seat, you see, on every recipe that I do. Right, liquid, 300 mils of water, okay? Now, if you live in somewhere really warm, you're probably going to need a little bit more water. But if you're living in England, you'll be all right with 300 mils, I'm sure. If you're living somewhere really cold, you'll find it absorbs slightly less liquid. So I'm going to show you what texture you're looking for. But just put your hand in the bowl in a sort of claw motion and just roll it around. You could do this in a mixer if you want to. That's absolutely fine. But we thought we'd do it by hand today and just show you the basics and then we'll turn it into something absolutely delicious. Okay, so bring it all together. Don't worry about making a mess because we're going to turn the dough out in a minute and knead it. But this is, this, you know, if you were here, you know, if you were at a cookery school learning bread, this is your basic dough that you would start with. So just to recap, and I'll ask Carlos to put the recipe down this side, is 500 grams of strong flour, seven grams of dried yeast, 10 grams of salt, 300 mils of water. That's it. That'll make you a loaf of bread. Okay, so let's just scoop that out. Get rid of this big white bowl because you don't like it, do you, Emily? <laughs> It's messing with her light and her exposure and her ISO and whew, all things that you don't care about. Okay, so just knead the dough. So hold it with one hand and turn it over itself like that. You see that all right, Emily? Yeah. Cool. So what we're gonna do now is we're trying to develop the gluten in the flour so that the dough becomes nice and stretchy. And the more stretchy the dough will become, the more it can hold the air pockets in. So, you know, as the yeast feeds on the natural sugars in the flour, it wants to create carbon dioxide, and that's how your bread rises. But you've got to condition the dough to keep that rise inside it. So the way to do that is to knead the dough. So you stretch it right out, bring it back, stretch and bring back, and just keep doing this for like five to 10 minutes. Now, there is another way, okay? Well, in fact, there's a few different ways. You could chuck it all in a bread maker if you own one of those. 
and just put it on the dough setting and let it do its thing. You could put it in an electric mixer like my, my KitchenAid over there and that will do the work for you. Or you could mix the dough together, put it in a bowl and just leave it in the fridge overnight and then you don't actually need to knead it, which is quite clever. But you can, can you see how this dough is now stretchier than it was before, Emily? And it's, yeah. not, it's not tearing like it was when we first started to mix it together. And all I'm doing is I come back onto my heels and then as I go forward, I go onto my toes. And that means you put less effort in, but you get more stretch. So it's kind of easier on you. Because I, I mean, I remember when I, when I had my first sort of bakery business, I couldn't afford a mixer. And we would be mixing 10 kilos of dough at, say, at once. So 20 times this. And it really took it out of you. <laughs> and it was hard work. But we, you know, that's what we had to do. And I sort of said to the guys who worked for me, the quicker we sell all this bread and the more loaves we make, the quicker I can buy a mixer. And that was our motivation. So we ended up sort of selling 150 loaves of bread a day for maybe a month. And then I was able to buy a mixer. <laughs> so... I really appreciate it these days. But you can kind of see how it's changed and it's developed and it becomes smoother and more elastic, okay? So once you've done that for 10 minutes, we can then put our bread to prove. So I'm gonna put it into a bowl, I'm gonna cover it with some clean film and I'm gonna leave it until it doubles in size, okay? Right, this dough, I made this earlier, it's doubled in size, can you see it all right? Yeah. Um, and you can see, by kneading it and stretching it, can you see that gluten structure? This is what I always do with my doughs. I sort of pull it and tear it and mess about with it, just so I can see what's going on. And I can see if the bread's got that nice sort of honeycomb texture inside, which I'm gonna show you now. So it comes out really easily, but let me show you. Can you see that sort of structure there, Emily? Yeah. When you sort of tear into the bread, you can see all the structural sort of fibers of the dough and it's really stretchy. If I sort of show you, look how stretchy it's become now. Yeah. Whereas the dough that I have just made isn't as stretchy as that, okay? So it's got, it's like, it's a developed dough now so I can work it, move it around. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the most incredible sort of swirl of bread and we're going to fill it with some delicious ingredients okay so first of all we need to get some flour so this is our basic 500 gram batch of dough and we're going to roll it into a rectangle okay these are absolutely perfect for picnicking really really good because you don't have to worry about sandwiches falling apart or anything like that the filling is baked inside the bread Right, so I've rolled this into a sort of rectangular shape and it's about half a centimetre thick, okay? And now we're gonna fill it. Now you could fill it with all kinds of different flavours. I've gone with mascarpone, mustard, parma ham, cheese and a little bit of honey because it's just gonna work. It's just a combination of flavours that you know are gonna taste good together. So, you know, you might go pesto, mozzarella, tomatoes, you might go cheese and marmite, you might go um, I don't know, mango chutney and coriander and maybe a bit of feta, kind of go where you want, go whichever flavor combo makes you tick. But we're gonna go with this. So I'm actually going to, um, I've got some mascarpone here that I'm gonna make it nice and creamy with because I think it'll taste even better. And I'm gonna add one egg yolk to half a tub of mascarpone and that'll help stabilize it so as it cooks it'll just sort of thicken a little bit what what i don't want to happen is the cream uh, and the mascarpone to sort of fall out as it's baking and this means that it'll sort of firm up a little bit so just take your mascarpone and your egg yolk mix it together and then just scoop it out now remember if you want any of the recipes from this series Type in the comments below, free book. Follow the instructions in Facebook Messenger and automatically we will deliver you a beautiful ebook. I think we're gonna have about 20 recipes in, are we, Emily? Yeah. There'll be 16 from the series 
and then we'll pick four other nice ones for you. Um, me and Emily and Carlos will sit and decide which ones make the cut, but follow the instructions and get the book that way, okay? That is the way that we deliver all our recipes now. So using the back of your spoon, just spread it all out. It's almost like a croque monsieur, this, but baked up inside. Everything's baked inside. It's going to be really tasty. Have you had anything like this before, Emily? I haven't actually. Ooh, first time, eh? Mm. Right, so nice thin layer of mascarpone. Now, to make that taste even better, I've got some whole grain mustard. You can use whatever mustards you like. I really like whole grain. I think it will work lovely. It's not too strong. Like English mustard's like rocket fuel, I think. You, it get, doesn't a nice, matter. you get a nice warmth from the whole grain, don't you? Yeah, it's just that nice sort of all-rounder. Um, so I'm gonna spread some of that on, and then I'm gonna hit it with some hot dog mustard. Oh, really? Just for extra, like not as hot as English. I'd go to maybe Dijon. Just that extra mustardy. It is gonna be mustardy, this, which is what I want. Okay, then, little drizzle of honey, which is a little bit out there, but I tell you what, it done half work. It just, that little hint of sweetness with the saltiness of the ham, and oh, it just works, I promise you. Now I've got some vintage cheddar here, so good, strong, mature that actually tastes of something. Medium cheddar is pointless in my opinion. Absolutely pointless. It just needs putting back in the cave for another year to come out until it's got some flavor in it, all right? <laughs> so just go for a good cheddar, good mature minimum, all right? There we go, let's get rid of that. And then I've got some lovely cured ham. So this is Parma ham, Serrano ham, prosciutto, Whatever. Is it just where it's from that gives it the different name? Well, yeah, Parma ham is obviously from Parma in Italy, which is in Emilia Romana, I believe. And then Serrano ham is Spanish. So really thinly sliced ham. I mean, if you can't get cured ham, you could probably use cooked, but you would want it super thin. Um, just so that it rolls nicely. And that saltiness of the ham will work incredibly well with the cheese, with the mustard, with the mascarpone. That little bit of honey will make the difference. Subtle, but it will make the difference, I promise. Okay, so now it's almost like a, it's like a pizza. It's all laid out, but we're just gonna take the far edge of the dough and turn it over. The trickiest bit is getting this started, okay? So once you get it the first roll, just push it away from you and then to roll it back, away and back, away. And that means it gets a nice tight roll. Otherwise it ends up a bit baggy in the middle and it won't, it's not as nice. Okay. There we go. Now, not quite. Just gonna roll it all the way over. I've got some beaten egg here. So I'm just gonna run that along the sides and that'll just help it hold together. Just a little bit. There we go. And then we roll it, okay? And that'll just seal it all up. And now what we've kind of got, you know, it could, you, could, you could bake this as it is actually, and it could be like a stromboli um, where all the flavor's in the middle. But I'm gonna take my dough cutter and I'm just gonna cut it in half, okay? So if I do that there, and that one there. Is that all right, Emily? It's perfect. I thought it might be. It's a nice camera angle over there, so. <laughs> and then if I just pop, I've got Masterclass non-stick baking trays. These are perforated, okay? So they've got a little bit of gaps and dimples on the bottom, and it means when you put things straight on, they don't sort of steam, they let a little bit of air underneath, and that helps for a better bake, I think. So, cut one and use that as your template for the next one. And by doing this, this isn't just me being odd and OCD having everything the same. It means everything will bake evenly, okay? Because as Emily might tell you, I'm like the opposite of OCD. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. It's stressful. <laughs> I'm DOC, I'm not OCD. <laughs> and then just turn them on their end and just pop them down. Okay. So we're going to bake them in a row of three because I want them to just sort of bake, not into each other, but just close enough that if they sort of lean one way, it'll just support it so they all go up. Okay. Right. Let's cut these. There we go. Right, let's pop these on there. Okay, let's just pop those trimmings over there out of the way. Right, so, can you see those all right, Emily? Johnny Walker. Pop them, just push them down a little bit and then we're just gonna take the remaining beaten egg and we're just gonna brush them. So they take up that lovely golden color. And then we're gonna leave these to prove for about 30 minutes, just in the open, not in, a war, not in an airing cupboard, that's a myth. Don't put your bread dough in airing cupboards, okay? The slower you'll prove, the more flavor you will develop, okay? What happens if you don't prove them? Um, they'll just be really dense. I mean, they'll bake but it'll be really thick and dense and yeah. chewy. Whereas what we want is sort of, we want the bread now, because we've sort of rolled it out and we've knocked the air out of it. We want the yeast to come back up again and start to feed again and start to create CO2. And that will stretch the dough, lighten it all up. And then once we put it in the oven, then it just bakes off and becomes nice and crisp on the outside. The amount of bread you've seen me bake over the years, Emily. You should be a whiz at this. I know. But you, that's why you make such good bread. <laughs> well, we've just started getting sourdough in the office going again. So a couple of weeks ago, I started a new sour and I thought, right, you know what? I'm going to get back onto sourdough making and I've developed a sourdough. And later on in the series, I'm going to show you how to make beautiful sourdough um, so that you can have a go as well. And it is really easy. And it's kind of the, the breads have got better each one we've yeah, made, haven't they? Yeah, so yeah, it's developed. once you get your starter dough going and bubbling and developing flavour, I think it takes about 10 days to get to a point where it's going to start to work. And then each loaf that you bake is getting better and better. So I'm now making a sourdough every three or four days for my house. I'm making one a week for Emily. I'm making one a week for my mother and father-in-law. <laughs> um, and it's it's... It, the more I do it, the more the bread develops and, and gets better and better and better. So look out for that episode. It's coming soon. Okay, so that will sit for half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. Depends how warm the kitchen is until it's proved and it's doubled in size. I'm going to put these away. I've got some that I've baked earlier. Right, okay. These are the ones that I baked a little bit earlier. They are golden and baked and looking delicious. And the good news is, Emily, it's time to try. Which one do you want me to tear out? Oh, oh. Go, for this. Go, for, go for an end one. An end one. Right, we'll go for this one. So you can see they've kind of all just... At, we've put them close enough that they support each other as they prove up, but they haven't sort of proved into each other to create one big solid mass. So you should be able to just tear them off like this. Yeah, you see? There we go. I think we're going to go for that one. Let's have a little try. So just to recap what's in here. Mascarpone cream. We've got egg yolk in there for richness. We've got mustard, two types. We've got a little bit of honey, and then we've got some cured ham. It's going to be a good one. Look, can you see that? Can you see how it's just sort of just layered up oh, through there? Nice. There you go. Have a little try of that. And I am going for one of these. The good thing is, look, you can kind of pull the middle bit out. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you have got to try these uh, filled sandwiches. They taste phenomenal. They are really, really nice. Well, I'm going to tuck into one of these again. While I'm doing that, Check out how to make these delicious ginger snap biscuits. Ginger biscuits are a British classic. 
First of all, you need to start with some room temperature butter, add in your white sugar and cream together using an electric whisk. Add in both flours, then add in your spices and your baking powder and your soda. Sieve that together straight into the mixing bowl. Add your rich golden syrup for that beautiful, crisp ginger snap biscuit. Cream together with the electric whisk until it forms a biscuit dough. Transfer the dough onto a lightly floured work surface and roll in a little bit of flour just to bring together. Then get your rolling pin out and roll to about half a centimetre thick. Use a biscuit cutter dipped in flour and cut out all your ginger biscuits. Then transfer onto a baking tray lined with a little bit of parchment paper if needed and bake in a preheated oven until golden and crisp. Why not enjoy your ginger biscuits with a good mug of tea? That's how you make my delicious ginger snap biscuits. I know they look really, really good and I promise you they are. Now, if you want the recipe, put in the comments below the video, free book. Just type it in. Follow the instructions that are on the screen here at the moment. It'll launch into Facebook Messenger. Just answer the questions and then it will deliver automatically a PDF of 20 amazing Peter Sidwell's Kitchen, Britain's best bakes recipes. You'll absolutely love it. And if you do bake anything, post us some comments, post us some images. I would love to see your bakes. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.